a disability insurance case where the claimant is going to get them significantly more money if they're found disabled than supplemental security income would. So it's very important to make sure that their date last insured is re reflected accurately. And kind of another part of that is that the judge will ask them, probably in some detail, what they did in their past work. A lot of people say, well, I can't remember 15 years ago. Okay, that's all right if you can't. Uh, but if you can, you need to you need to try to explain the type of work you did and how much you had to lift, how much you had to walk, how long you had to stand, uh, you know, how much contact did you have with people, those sorts of things. Because that those are all factors that the judge will consider when determining whether or not you're disabled. <laughs> Good afternoon, Dan. How are you? I'm good, Peter. How are you? I'm great. And and I should start off as uh, your honor. Uh, version. No. <laughs> no. Uh, such a great pleasure to uh, sit down and chat with you. And just as a quick introduction for some guests um, who may not know who you are, uh, you are Dan Hyatt, former Social Security law judge for, I think, over almost 20 years plus. Yeah. Uh, rich history in criminal defense, uh, civil work, um, and then also military work. Uh, an Oregon native, uh, but now living in California. Um, you've done thousands and thousands of hearings, Social Security disability hearings as a yeah. judge. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if you're in the thousands range, but probably close to it, uh, representing claimants in front of the Social Security Administration all over the country. Uh, and we have the great privilege of having you work with our firm uh, and representing clients uh, uh, in their disability cases now. And hey, thank you, Peter. Yeah, I enjoy it. I enjoy, you know, here I am, 74 years old. I'm not going to slow down. I enjoy helping people, you know. No, and I know that's your heart and you, uh, at your core, love to help people and uh, love to kind of walk with them and bring all your your wisdom and your knowledge into the hearing room and into preparation um, and how to uh, kind of put them in the best possible position to win. Um, yeah. yeah. You don't win every single case, but you sure do win a lot. So uh, yeah, I thought before we kind of dived into our conversation today, uh, we remind folks of who you are and I'll link to um, our last podcast. I'll put it in the, in the description box. Uh, where they can sort of watch that amazing bio that uh, you and I got to sit down and talk about your rich history and then um, sort of talk about behind the scenes uh, of what's going on in the social security world at the hearing level. Uh -huh. um, great as well. Good, so, good, good. Okay. What can I do for you today? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. One of the things I wanted to pick your brain on is and I think you know we've had some different videos throughout, but one of the things I wanted to pick your brain on is from maybe a judge's perspective, um, but also in combination, you know, obviously you've been representing clients down in front of the Social Security in front of the Social Security Administration uh, for several years. Um, yeah. But from that primary judge's perspective, and also a little bit of a of an attorney perspective, what are some of the top things? that a client or a claimant can do to prepare themselves for a hearing? Like what, what are some things that would help the decision maker, a yeah. judge yeah. that a client can get, you know, pretty familiar with uh, in the weeks or the days or the months um, before the hearing? Because as you and I both know, there's a 75 day notice requirement. That's right. Uh, that Social Security is required to send a written notice uh, 75 days before the hearing. Right. So during that time frame, what are things the client can do to prepare? Now, our audience is not just probably some of our clients, but also people who may be represented by other attorneys or not represented at all. So maybe mm -hmm. can I answer a question for that audience? So what would be like the number one thing or uh, at the top of the list that uh, you for that? Sure. sure. Okay. Well, the first thing, obviously, uh, is for uh, 
to make sure that the attorney or the representative uh, has all of the medical records of treatment that the claimant has. Right. Uh, and let me give you an example. When I'm sitting up there as a judge and somebody comes in and they say, well, I've got uh, a problem with my right hip. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is, is look and see if that is in the medical records, if there have been complaints or treatment for the right hip. And if there's no treatment or no records showing that, that affects the credibility of that claimant. It makes me wonder, well, when did this come up, you know? And so, you know, if they've actually been treated for a hip problem and the medical records don't support that, uh, or the records that I'm looking at as the judge don't reflect that, that's that's going to reflect adversely on the claimant. So they always will want to go through their medical record with their rep or their attorney, or even if it's just them, they need to look at their file and make sure that all of their medical records are included, all of their treatment records are included. Right. So... So as attorneys, we can log into uh, the Electronic Record Express, which is we're registered for and look at all our clients' files and review right. what's called the F section. Right. It's missing. Um, as a client or a claimant, if you're not rep, you need to call your local hearing office where you or you're the hearing office that sent you that notice of hearing and figure out how to access your file. And I think right. what they, they mail CDs uh, to the to the claimants for them to review. One of the things you said, which is, I think, brilliant, is that so many clients will walk in and say, like, look, I have, like you said, depression, um, but it's been, was diagnosed 15 years ago, and mm -hmm. I'm, but I don't get it treated other than I might take a antidepressant. And if they're alleging that that is their primary or even secondary disability from a judge's perspective, your response is, yeah, this is how does that exactly? I mean, you know, the, the less treatment, um, the less likely it is that it's it's a disability that's going to prevent that person from working. Let me ask you this: Is there a magic number on like? certain diagnoses or just generally even speaking how often from a judge's perspective do you think a client needs to see a doctor is it once every week once a month once a year once a quarter yeah and it's a tough question to ask but there's no there's no bright line on that peter um obviously if a person hasn't seen a, a doctor or a treating source in a year then I'm gonna I'm gonna wonder how bad they they really are. Uh, how bad are their conditions that they haven't got, gotten any medical treatment? Now that's gotten complicated in the last few years with COVID because so many people are now treating remotely with their doctor. Uh, but at least if, even if they're only treating remotely, I'll want to see that record. I want to see what's going on with them, what their complaints have been what kind of treatment they've received and whether it's been of any benefit or not. Right. I think there's, you know, and clients will ask me this question, which is why I brought it up to you. I think it is tough because there is no magic number. I think so much of it is diagnostic dependent, right? Like yeah. you're yeah. suffering from severe mental health issues, you know, and you're only going kind of once a year to get medicated for it and it's still not helping you, you know, I, I would suggest that, you know, probably you need to go see a counselor or or see someone more often than that. I think, yeah. it, at least in my experience, uh, judges will say, hey, what have you done to try to help yourself get better? Like, really help yourself get better because once a year is not working. Well, that's a really good point, Peter. And the other, the other that kind of segues into the next part of this, and that is if if, if your doctor recommends that you undergo physical therapy or recommends that you take a medication or recommends that you go see a rheumatologist and sets that up for you and you don't follow through, that doesn't look good. It, 
it makes it look like, well, it couldn't have been that bad if they didn't get treatment for it. So right. that's something to remember for sure. Great tip. So review your file. You want to do that way in advance that way, because if you're going to order medical records yourself, yeah. uh, you're going to need to know how it's not like medical records appear overnight. So you got to give the facility some time to get the records to you. Yeah. Uh, and then you got to get them back to social security uh, and then uh, give the judge plenty of time. And he's, it's usually at least five full business days before the hearing uh, for right. the judge to review them. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Is there, what, what about a number two, a number two step that uh, a client or a claimant can do to prep for their hearing? Okay. I think in connection with reviewing their record medically, they need to take a look at their earnings history, which is in their file, uh, their work history. There's a form that uh, claimants are, they're not required to fill out, but they are supposed to fill it out. And it would indicate what their past jobs have been over the last 15 years, uh, what kind of exertional level. In other words, has it been heavy work, like a logger, or has it been light work, like a receptionist? There are, uh, that, that's important for the claimant to, to be conversant with their past work history and their earnings. And sometimes uh, I have had cases, both as a judge and as an attorney, where there's been a mistake made in what their insured, their last insured date is. So let's just take a, a, a hypothetical situation. The hypothetical is a husband and wife own a business and the wife does the bookkeeping, the husband is out on the road selling whatever the product is. Well, the husband, uh, all of the income is attributable to the husband, but in reality, the husband and wife both <clears throat> work equally in that business. And there are occasions where you can actually extend insured status, which is very important for benefit purposes. You can extend insured status by getting Social Security to correct your record to reflect that, in fact, you were earning half of that money, and therefore you get additional covered quarters. Now, this is getting a little esoteric, but I think it's an important point to make for people is that when you work, you pay FICA taxes. Those FICA taxes buy you disability insurance. And if you stop working, that insurance will run for about five years after you stop working. Um, that is completely different than supplemental security income, which is for people with a disability that don't have insurance. And generally, a disability insurance case where the claimant is going to get them significantly more money if they're found disabled than supplemental security income would. So it's very important to make sure that their date last insured is re reflected accurately. And kind of another part of that is that the judge will ask them probably in some detail what they did in their past work. A lot of people say, well, I can't remember 15 years ago. Okay. That's all right if you can't. Uh, but if you can, you need to you need to try to explain the type of work you did and how much you had to lift, how much you had to walk, how long you had to stand, uh, you know, how much contact did you have with people, those sorts of things, because that those are all factors that the judge will consider when determining whether or not you're disabled. No, that's a great piece of advice. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's uh, important to know, too, that by the time you're at the hearing, there was a form that uh, almost every single claimant, well, is asked to fill out, and that's the uh, work history form. Right. And they usually fill that out when they first apply. Right. And the average wait time right now is about three years from the date you apply to the date you get in front of a judge. And so to and and the judge is going to have that work history form in in front of them, right? So um, you know, one of the things we do is we email um, or mail the work history form to all our clients in preparation for their hearing to review. Um, so there's that form as well, and the questions in that form, the sitting, the standing, the walking, the lifting. You know, did you manage anybody? Did you mm -hmm. how you know were you were helping customers or were you working right you know in a right. room yeah these are the types of questions that the judge may dive into that are on the floor 
And yes. so that can help you prepare for the questions with the judge. And then the other thing that we email or mail to our clients on, on Title II claims, especially, like you said, is that there's what's called the details, uh, detailed work history form mm -hmm. that is by Social Security that outlines all the work uh, and how much money they made at each job in the last right. 15 years. Right. Some judges, and it, it, at least in my experience, they love to get, go job by job by job by job. Yeah. Which take a long time if a claimant had 35 different jobs in the last 15 years. Yes. And so and the judge will also want to know why they left that work, you know? Right. Is it because of their impairments or was there a conflict with a supervisor? Did they just get tired of working? You know, whatever the reason was, that's going to be asked. Yeah, no. Yeah, for sure. Well, great tips. Is there is there like a third thing or something else that uh, you may suggest to claimants uh, to prep for their uh, hearing? Yes, there is. Uh, I think probably third most important is going to be medication. Uh, generally, uh, I know your firm uh, submits a document to the court, usually about 10 days before the hearing, that lists the medications that the claimant is on. That's very important, but the claimant also needs to be prepared to answer with respect to those medications, whether they're helpful or not. A typical question to a claimant would be, well, I see you take escitalopram for depression. Is it helpful? The claimant can either say yes or no. If they say yes, well, then how much does it help? If they say no, then the judge's next question is, well, why are you taking it? The you know, a, a reasonable answer is always going to be because my doctor continues to prescribe it, but, you know, that, it's it's a legit, legitimate area of inquiry as to whether or not medication is really working and whether the medication that you've been recommended to take, whether you take it or not. Because if you don't, there is a regulation, as you know, that, that allows a judge to hold that against you if you've been prescribed medication and you're not taking it and there's a psychologist or some other medical professional gives the opinion that if you were taking that you would improve that's going to probably torpedo your case yeah yeah you know I'm, i agree 100 percent. i think um what, what else they should be prepared to answer regarding medications is a lot of times judges will want to know how much you're taking and how often you're taking it. And right. I think having that uh, be prepared to answer that question right. uh, is important. That brings up a fourth uh, kind of thing that I wanted to ask you uh, in yeah. relation to the medications. What do you think about being prepared or at least thinking about as a claimant, as a fourth tip, the negative side effects of the medication and testifying about that? So I'm taking it. It's helping with the depression. But oh, my gosh, I am drowsy all day or what? Yeah. Do you think? Yeah. No, I think that's a, a really good point, Peter, that a lot of medications do have significant side effects. And that's one of the reasons as well why the judge is going to want to know what your dosage is. And let me give you an example. Neurontin or gabapentin, uh, it's a, a medication that's frequently prescribed, uh, and it's usually in dosages of 300 milligrams uh, because generally you've got to be right around, I would say, 900 milligrams for it to really have much of an effect. I've seen a lot of people that are on a maximum dose of gabapentin or neurontin of 2,400 milligrams. Now, wow. at 2,400 milligrams of gabapentin, you or I are probably going to be almost drooling. It's, it's like you're kind of out of it. And a person taking that much gabapentin that their doctor has prescribed is probably mentally not going to be able to perform the requirements of any work. So if, you know, you need to be able to address whether you have side effects. Narcotics are notable for producing side effects. Uh, they'll slow down uh, uh, digestion. Um, they will make you feel kind of stupid. 
Uh, there, there are a lot of side effects to narcotic medications, but a lot of other medications have significant side effects that alone could be enough to disable you. Right. And just as a, we're not doctors, we're, we're lawyers. Uh, but, um, this is based off of our experience of meeting people who've taken yes. of drugs and, yes. and negative side effects. What a great tip because, um, have you as a judge found anyone disabled or a fully favor granted a fully favorable decision just based off the negative side effects from medication? Yes. Yes. yes, I have. Okay. And I, I wouldn't say it's frequent, but it's not uncommon. And if you take a person, so here's the kind of the, the way a judge looks at it. You've got exertional impairments and non-exertional impairments. There's, Exertional is your ability to lift, carry, walk, stand, you know, requires physical exertion. Non-exertional are like mental impairments like depression, anxiety, um, a, a lot of different um, impairments that if you've got an exertional impairment and a non-exertional impairment together, those can make you disabled. And that is frequently the case. Um, if you've got somebody that has a bad back uh, and they're depressed, but they're not getting any treatment for depression, well, then, you know, the question is, does their bad back alone make them disabled? Well, it might, but if they're taking medication and they're getting side effects from that medication, for instance, gabapentin is frequently prescribed for people with nerve pain, let's say back pain. Well, if they're if they're kind of kind of ditzy because that medication and you add that to the exertional impairment, their back problem, you probably have a winner case. So it's important to know that. Right. Yeah. I'll share a story with you. I was once in a hearing uh, where the claimant was a advanced aged neurosurgeon. Okay. He had a mild stroke, very mild. Um, but what happened was, is it caused his hands to have a small tremor. Yeah. The, the stroke did. Yeah. And he had to take medication to keep the, you know, to keep the stroke from reoccurring. Sure. And the medication caused him severe fatigue. He was tired and, yeah. and, and that was it. And, um, the judge in that hearing recognized that <clears throat> Typical neurosurgery could last eight to 12 hours. And yeah. so he can't be that fatigued and tired trying to stand on his feet for eight to 12 hours to operate yeah. uh, and uh, granted him a fully favorable decision in that hearing uh, based off of, because with the medications, the tremors went away. Uh huh. Without but the medication. And he's got fatigue. Yeah. So uh. I always think about that case when I think about the negative side effects because that was literally the testimony. Yeah. Uh, and the judge granted a, a fully favorable uh, kind of Johnny on the spot. So that sounds reasonable. Yeah. Very I, much. I mean, granted, he was advanced age, a long career. So many things are taken into consideration, as you know. Oh, yeah. His, his earnings record was the, the largest 15 year earnings of like, you know, I think it was like $900,000 a year. Uh, and so the <laughs> judge was like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I knew I should have been a neurosurgeon. We're not making this up. Yeah. So um, is there a fifth kind of thing or, or something else uh, that you would uh, advise claimants in prepping for their hearing? Yeah. Uh, so you and I have talked about this many times, and that is philosophically, I don't encourage people to practice before they testify. I don't encourage people to... Um, you know, have a litany of uh, complaints that uh, they're reading off a list. Uh, what is very important to the judge more than anything is it's a credibility determination. So, you know, but there are some things that you can anticipate, the four or five things we've already discussed, but it's not going to be uncommon for a judge to ask a claimant, why can you not work? What is it that makes you unable to work? And some people will say, well, 
you know, I've got chronic pain or I'm really tired or I don't feel well or whatever. Sometimes people will say, you know, I think I can work, but it would have to be a sit down job or, uh, and if you're over 50 and you haven't done sit down jobs before, you're probably going to be found disabled. So it's always good to be honest with the judge about what you feel you can or cannot do, but you do need to be prepared to answer that question. It, it kind of reminds me of a case, uh, many years ago that I, that I had as a judge where the, the, the claimant was, um, I was doing cases in Alaska Fairbanks on a, on a hearing trip. And the person had been, um, they had been a uh, crab uh, person. Uh, they were a crab catcher in, uh, off the coast of Oregon. But so they said, well, there aren't any crabs up here in Fairbanks, so I can't work. Well, that's not going to get it. That's, you know, you have to be unable to do any work and it doesn't, or another one is, well, I can't drive that far. Okay. Well, the ability to drive or not, because your job is a little farther away, or I can't work because I've got a six year old at home. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, but you know, that doesn't mean you can't work. So that's something to maybe discuss with your lawyer. Uh, before your hearing or your representative, uh, and that is exactly why you feel you can't work. Because if you tell me I'm the judge and you tell me I can't work because I've got a six-year-old at home, I'm going to tell you, well, that's a six-year-old is not a disability. A six-year-old is a handful, as you know, Peter, but it's not a disability. It might be for the parent, you know, if you've got a crazy kid, but no. Not, it's just not going to get it. Well, this is one of the questions uh, and pieces of advice, I think, where you and I agree and probably in different ways. So maybe agree and disagree in, in both ways. I agree that claimants should not walk into a hearing and feel like their testimony is rehearsed and or that they're reading from a script or, or whatnot. Right. Where... I think I disagree a little bit um, is just in the, to think about questions and, and mm -hmm. not disagreeing, but just, I have clients write down a little list as a reference point, not a script, a list. And the reason I love this piece of advice to think about why you can't work is because the question is sort of, and no offenses to judges out there. And you and I have talked about certain judges out there. Uh, sure. Some are better than others. Um, I think that the question really is, in my opinion, would be better asked, what are the top three or four diagnoses that you believe keep you from working? And what are the symptoms related to that, those diagnoses? Right, right. Because when they do ask, why can't you work? I've heard, like you said, all sorts of answers where, you know, oh, I'm a convicted felon. I can't work because of that. Or I'm my kids or my this or that. Yeah, yeah. It's job up here. Or, or, or worse yet, I've seen judges who ask that question in almost every hearing. Why can't you work? And, and clients will like, I can't sit very long or stand very long or walk very far. And the judges are getting frustrated because they're like, well, why? Well, yeah. Why? 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 And I'm just right. like, well, just ask the question of what are your top three or four diagnoses? Yeah. Uh, and so we encourage clients, uh, at least I do, um, to write down your three or four or five top diagnoses. And, yes. and, and like you said earlier, they have to be supported by the medical record. Right. If you're going to write down depression in that list and you haven't seen a psychologist, psychiatrist, counselor, or any mental health treatment in the last five years or three years or two years or even the last year, I would say yeah. leave it off. Yeah. Yeah. Because you'll lose yeah. credibility. Good. But, Good. but <clears throat> if it likes, you know, if you walk in and say, I have diabetes, well, you need to be prepared to put that at the top if that's your number one thing, but talk about the symptoms. I know plenty mm -hmm. of people with diabetes who work. Sure. I know plenty of people, uh, you know, just obviously in our line of work with diabetes who can't work. And there's a huge range of symptoms and severity. Right. So, you know, I think when they're really asking that question, why can't you work? 
I would say to, uh, to claimants or people who are getting ready for a hearing, and this is my opinion, I know we differ here, I would say write down just a top three, four diagnosis and top, and think about the symptoms that go with that diagnosis. Don't just See, say diabetes. Yeah, I think, so in that respect, I think we're in agreement. If If the claimant testifies, well, I've got unrelenting back pain, that's my number one problem. Uh, and I can't sit very long, and I can't stand or walk for very long. I, if it hurts all the time, I have to lay down. That's one thing. But for 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 a claimant to come in and say, "Well, I've got spondylolisthesis at L4 and L5," I'm going to go. You know, I don't. As a judge, I don't want to hear a medical uh, diagnosis. I want to hear what the symptoms are that make you unable to work. So in that respect. I agree, and they, and they should be prepared to say, in order, if they've got four or five impairments, what is the most severe, what's the second most severe, and how does that prevent them from doing work? And, and what's interesting, and, and this is where I think we agree, I think if you write down spondylotheosis or write down all these complicated diagnoses and you mm. go in there and you try to sound like someone who's a doctor or as a claimant, and you try to sound like, if, when you start writing down complicated diagnoses, it is going to sound rehearsed. Yeah. So instead of saying that, just say back pain. Yeah. Simplify it. Symptom. And, yeah, right. It's back pain. And I'd yeah. get more specific than that. Like, be prepared to answer, is it upper, middle, lower back, your entire back? Be prepared to answer, is it constant? Does it come and go? Mm -hmm. uh, the question that I hear from judges or or if judges don't ask, I'll ask just to, for clarification in the record is, you know, the free, what does it feel like? Is it burning? Is it sharp? Is it shooting? Mm -hmm. um, to give some, you're trying to use your words to paint a picture for right. it uh, so they can understand. Right. And, and you don't want to sound scripted. I absolutely agree. But it is a nerve wracking moment, I think, for claimants uh, to go in front of a judge and you have the kindest judges on the planet, and then you have some very mean judges. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and then you can get tongue-tied or forget, and, you know, even what is the number two thing that keeps me from working, right? Like, Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, uh, Peter, and I think connected to that is something I, I feel it's really important to say, and that is to people who are going to go to court, it's probably one of the most anxiety-producing events they will ever go through. Yeah. I mean, I've had to testify, and when I, I remember I was scared to death. And as a trial lawyer with a couple of other jury trials under my belt and forty-five years of experience, and I get nervous. I can only imagine what somebody that isn't conversant and hasn't been doing this feels like. So that is something to remember. And that in that respect, it's good that we're going through this list because. People who have anxiety or get anxious, they're going to forget. And they're just, some people just freeze, you know? So it's good if you're going to, if you're that, if you, that's how you respond to anxiety and you know that, it's good to maybe make, make some lists for yourself. Right. No is going to not let you look at a piece of paper that you wrote your things on, especially if you say, look, I'm just anxious. Can I, can I read from this list? So, yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think, um, if if that is going to be, you know, and 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 luckily, I, I don't think I've had to testify in court under oath yet in my life. Um, mm -hmm. But I I do think that you know, and I'm not saying write a script. <clears throat> I'm just saying make a little list. You know, like yeah. groceries. You yeah, know, exactly. Um, like the medications. Right. A list. Yeah. Exactly. So one of those things that, you know, and I'll throw this tip in there, it will be number six, I think, on our list is uh, thinking about ADLs. And maybe you can tell everyone from a judge's perspective the types of questions you might have asked uh, in a hearing about mm -hmm. ADLs. What are ADLs? Yeah, those are activities of daily living. And uh, we all have ADLs. We'll get up in the morning and, you know, brush our teeth, take a shower, you know, maybe have breakfast. It's ADLs are the things that you do on a daily basis. And it's, 
you're going to get asked by the judge uh, either a, 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 a typical question is, what is a typical day like for you? Or it might even be, well, what did you do yesterday? And so by that, the judge wants to know, how do you spend your time during the day if you're not working? You know, are you watching TV? Are you on a computer? Um, are you reading books? Uh, those are all very telling of uh, mental capacity for work. For instance, if you can read a book and you're reading two books a week, well, that kind of knocks out an argument that you don't have the mental capacity, you know, to sustain competitive employment. Um, if you're going for a walk and you walk five miles a day, that's going to knock out an argument that you can't uh, do standing and walking as part of a job. So it's important to kind of be able to respond to the judge as to what you do during the day with some specificity. I don't think you want to just say, well, I just, I don't really do anything. You know, we've seen claimants that will sit there and say, well, I just look out the window all day. No, that's not right. I don't believe that. So it's good to be prepared to address with some detail what a typical day for you is like. And because that's one of the ways the judge is going to figure out, you know, whether you've got the capacity to work. Right. I think I hear that question, uh, how com it's common. How do you spend a typical day? And equally as common, and I'm glad you brought that question up, is uh, in a response of, I don't do anything. Well, mm -hmm. like you said, it, everyone does something. Uh, yeah. Whether that's getting up to get a cup of coffee or making yourself a, a, a cup of coffee. Um, you know, and what I encourage folks is to think about it. You know, yeah. what is a typical day look like? Do you make your own breakfast? Because the judge mm -hmm. would want to know that. Or does someone make it for you? You know, I think this question, how do you spend a typical day? Because, and, and this would probably be the the next piece of advice I'd, I'd give is think about your ability to sit, stand, walk, and lift. You know, because mm -hmm. that usually comes up in a hearing as well as how long can you sit before yeah. you change positions or how long can you stand before you need to sit down? How far can you walk in city blocks before you need to stop and rest? Um, you know, and how much weight can you lift without hurting yourself? Mm -hmm. You know, and... You know, sometimes people will say, you know, and this could go back to when they're talking about their symptoms or talking about negative side effects of their medications, because usually that will come first. That line of questioning will come first before their uh, ADLs mm -hmm. and they'll say, hey, look, I take this. I take gabapentin. It makes me extremely tired and I have to and, and I need to nap during the day. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And then about 20 minutes later, the judge is going to ask, describe a typical day to, to me. And then if you fail to mention that you nap in a typical day, then it's not going to look consistent. Right. right? And Consistency so, is important. Yeah. Oh, it's so important. I, I mean, yeah. obviously, I, I was, I've never been a social security judge or a judge, uh, but my my assumption is, is like, gosh, this guy says he's sleeping, taking two to three naps a day or, or this gal. But then they describe their typical day and they never mention that they're taking a nap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's important. So I think, you know, be consistent with the reasons you're saying you can't work or the negative side effects of medication and then how you spend your typical day. Right. Uh, and then don't just say nothing. I mean, I'll have people say, just walk, just kind of walk. What time do you get up? What's, what's there? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And sometimes, and, and this is where you and I may not always agree. I say just jot down a little diary of how you spend your typical day. Make sure it doesn't sound rehearsed. Um, but at the same time, don't walk in and just be like, I don't know, nothing. Well, if you want to, if you want to write down a diary, Peter, I don't, I don't object to that so much. Uh, it's the rehearsed part that I think. But if if a claimant says, well, judge, my lawyer asked me to write this down because he thought you might ask me this. And so do you mind if I tell you, you know, I did, I wrote down yesterday what I did. Do you mind if I read from my, you know, you can always pin it on the lawyer. <laughs> so you can always, you were saying, you can always pin it on the lawyer. Yeah. And um, 
Well, one of the things I have a curiosity about, um, just from your perspective as a judge, with the judge hat, and maybe this would be our, I'm starting to lose track, but our next big tip. Mm -hmm. You know, when clients are asked these big opening questions, why can't you work? Mm -hmm. What negative side effect? I mean, they're open-ended. Yeah. Any tips on how to answer that? Do you... Do you appreciate a long-winded answer or no judge? No. Are you I I tell people generally to listen to the question. And if they forget everything else, that's really important. To listen to the question and respond to the question. Anxiety affects people in different ways. And one of the ways a lot of people with anxiety problems they'll just ramble on and on because talking is how they deal with that anxiety that they're feeling. They'll just talk and talk and talk. And so pretty soon, if, if you do that, you're going to start mentioning some things that aren't in the record. And then the judge may follow up with that and say, well, what do you mean? You know, you didn't mention that you've got headaches or whatever. You're just opening a can of worms the more you say, and especially the less responsive you are to the question. That's very important. That, And I've had to remind clients at council table, please respond to the question. You know, don't, don't go off on a tangent. Don't, you know, and the other thing, Peter, these people have been waiting a long time for their chance to go to court. And that alone is enough for them to like just... Uh, they want to say everything all at once. They're afraid they're going to forget, so they just start. And, you know, fortunately, most of the judges recognize that there's a lot of anxiety involved with testifying. But, you know, it's try to try to be concise and to the point in your responses. And if you don't remember or you don't understand the question, it's okay to say that. Just, you know... And the judge might say, well, what would, what would remind you? What would, you know, that job that you had back in, in 2012, do you remember where it was? Do you remember what you did? You know, and so you can get prompts from the judge. And if the judge doesn't ask you, and I'm your representative, I'm going to have a chance to ask you that. So just don't worry about getting the right answer. Get, just tell the truth the best you can remember. And if you miss something, when it's my turn, I'll ask you about it. Right. That's, that's a good tip. I, we kind of advise our clients, as you know, kind of the three core rules to answering questions under oath and in court. I mean, like you said, it, it can be anxiety inducing. It can be mm -hmm. not a normal conversation because right. you know, you're under oath and you're being recorded. Uh, right. So, you know, the, the practice this before the hearing yeah, is rule number one, listen to the question, right? right? Rule number two, make sure you understand the question, right? Because yeah. if you don't understand, it's okay to ask, I'm sorry, your honor, I don't understand. And most judges will, you know, explain it to you. Mm -hmm. um, and rule number three is answer only the question asked, right? Right. And on and on and on. Um, you know, and, and that's tough for people, like you said, because, uh, they get into situations and, and I think that's just generally how we talk to each other, you know, yeah. Yeah. I'll tell folks, it's kind of like that classic law school question of, you know, excuse me, uh, do you know what time it is? And if you pick apart that question, it's literally, as you know, a yes or no answer. So mm -hmm. someone walks up to you uh, in a coffee shop and they're, they're like, Hey, do you know what time it is? If you know, yes, I do. <laughs> yes. Right. I mean, cause yeah. you answer the question now the person's going to look at you and think smart ass, but right. you know, but that's how you practice. And yep. that, and, and in a hearing, it doesn't need to be at that level. Uh, I mean, we're not in criminal court and it, you know, I, I right. think, the social security hearing, it doesn't have to be that stern, but that's how you start to train your mind. Like if you're having conversations with a family member, significant other, roommate, whoever, uh -huh. 
can start practicing in that way. Just listen to what they're actually asking you. Yeah. Yeah. And then respond. Yeah. Uh, so that's a good tip. Uh, and, and, you know, we talk about not rambling in court, but, you know, kind of with the overall thesis of how to prepare before you can practice that with everyday conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so just, you know, before I had, a, I had another uh, question, how should people dress? You know, do mm -hmm. they need to go out and buy a new suit before the hearing? Um, no, no, I think. Generally, people should dress comfortably as they normally would, uh, but you don't want to wear sweatpants or a T-shirt in into court. This is a federal court proceeding, and there is a certain degree of solemnity and uh, whatever I want to say, uh, formality about it. It's not terribly formal, but it's enough so that you've got to show respect to the court. And so you want to try to be clean and dress nicely, but do not, you don't have to dress up. You don't have to wear a tie. Women don't have to wear like a dress or a skirt. I mean, they can dress however they would normally, for instance, to maybe go downtown or go shopping or something. Yeah. I think that's a great piece of advice. And obviously that's if you're in person or over video. And I, that's one of the reasons I love phone hearings is because yeah. you don't have to worry about appearance. Um, yeah. And, uh, and as you know, I used to work with in Social Security, mm -hmm. and I think there are judges historically, um, not you, but other judges that would make like note of this person dressed nicely, this person dressed disheveled, this person, you know. Um, yeah. And, and uh, so I do think they take those type of things into consideration. I think, um, is there any other tips that you would give bef that a claimant or a client should do before they go to a hearing? You know, Peter, you've got some really good uh, information on the Evans Disability website. I I mean, it's really valuable. I, I don't know any other uh, attorneys uh, or law firms doing this type of work that have the inventory of... Uh, forms and uh, videos and mock hearing and uh, just a ton of information is available on the Evans Disability website. And I recommend that people take a look at that. It's not going to, it's not going to hurt you and, and it's going to make you feel more comfortable when you do go to court and you have to tell your story. You're going to be more comfortable knowing You've already kind of seen this on a video. So that's the only other thing I would add. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. That's uh, that, that's quite a compliment coming from you. Um, and I appreciate it a lot. There are some great videos. I'll link them uh, in to this video. Uh, mm -hmm. But we do have your, uh, we do have the mock hearing video uh, where it was me, you, Jack, uh, and Isabella who got together yeah. and we pretended to be uh, not a hard stretch for you because I think you played the role of the judge, uh, but uh, and or Jack who played the role of the uh, uh, hearings attorney, um, but we pretended to put on a hearing. Yeah, uh, and I think that's a great way just to watch to sort of see what might be coming. Exactly. And I'll, uh, I'll link yeah, that yeah. below. Yeah, uh, we also have our pre-hearing conference video that we send out to clients um, to kind of talk about like some tips to do in preparation. Uh, mm -hmm on our website. So I really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, your honor, I appreciate, uh, your time today. Great, valuable tips for, um, people to do and prep for their hearing. And yeah. uh, I'm super as always grateful. And I hope to see my you. pleasure. I hope to see it. Actually, I'm going to see you on Friday. So, uh, yeah, we'll plan on that for sure. Looking forward to it.